Just a few weeks ago, uh, I wrote a piece for The Age newspaper questioning the idea and the public funding of uh, a gay art. Um, fortunately, my editor, Gina, had a sense of fun and agreed to run this piece just as the festival Midsummer, a gay and lesbian event which um, has a central cultural and arts focus, was high kicking into its Bob Fosse gear. So in the piece, I proposed that promoting Homosexual, promoting homosexuality in the arts seemed about as desperately needed as promoting white men in politics or camellia bushes in the city of Glen Ira. Um, so naturally when you poke fun at the gardens of Elstonwick you expect some blowback and I certainly got mine on the day of publication. So that morning by the time I'd finished my first cup of tea I had two red hot messages which is unusual. Usually I write an opinion piece, no one cares. Um, the first was from a drag persona with whom I'm a little acquainted. Um, and this person was performing in the festival uh, and he accused me of writing darkly um, from the closet. So in his view, I, for proposing that the idea of gay art was flawed, was self-hating Lezo, who had no business taking these views into a mainstream arts publication. Um, the proper place for discussion, he said, was in the gay press. Now, I think he's wrong on, on both counts. First, I believe the proper place to talk on matters of marginal sexuality or marginal art or marginal anything for that matter is the civic news, the broadest audience possible. Um, second, as any freelance writers in the room will know, the gay press pay five cents a word um, and they do so only if you send a letter of demand. So we'd rather write for Fairfax. Um, the next message I received before uh, my cup of tea had gone cold began, you homophobic slag. Um, this man, it seemed, had absolutely no use for sal salutation. Um, and it continued, I wouldn't piss on you if a lesbian set you on fire and drive over the top of you. So upon, that's verbatim. So upon reading his response, my first concern was for my safety. Um, was this person who was sketched by Google as a 36-year-old unemployed Australian foodie I, I don't know about you, but I've always suspected of people who shop at the Collingwood Children's Farm of violence. Um, I mean, have you been there? There's like seething resentment with every hemp bag. Um, so was he going to hire an incontinent lesbian to run me down in her Subaru Outback? Um, should I perhaps buy some waterproof raiment just in case? Would he or his lesbian friend be appeased by a gift of spelt and linseed loaf um, or perhaps the Stephanie Alexander cookbook. Some nice hand cream from Aesop, something like that. Um, so that was my first concern for my safety. But my second concern, just as naturally, um, was for the educators who had let this poor 36-year-old unemployed foodie down so badly. Faced with such a confusion of articles and modifiers, I had no idea who was or was not going to piss on me and who in the name of all that is queer was going to drive over my freshly pissed upon person. Anyway, he continued, keep your narrow-minded, bigoted opinions to yourself, or keep it, it, sick, um, sir, the subject is plural, um, <coughs> to religious press, where would I expect it? It's them. Uh, um, he saw me, he said, as an unintelligent creature that is lower than the bile I would spit on in a toilet bowl. Now, this response prompts many questions from me, not the least of which is, why is there bile in your toilet? Um, it reminds me, I've had many responses to this and other post-gay pieces I've written for press, that there's really very little scope um, about debate, about the idea that we have of this thing called gay. Um, gay just does not evolve and its curators, the curators of this thing called gay, um, don't want the idea of it tarnished. Um, it's become a little bit like a museum piece, it seems to me, this idea of gay. If you dare to suggest um, that gay thing, it's just a crusty old fossil, you'll be thrown out of the gallery. Now, before we talk about art in particular, um, I wanted to look more generally at the idea of, of gay and why it resists examination. Um, so excuse me if you've heard all this uh, post-gay talk before, but I want to make sure we're all more or less reading from the same book of common prayer. Um, there are many things in the world of which we can't be certain. Um, two spring most immediately to mind. One never knows what Charlie Sheen, the rock star from Mars, is going to say next. And you never really know if you're in a room full of people who spent their 20s reading Foucault. 
um, not something I necessarily recommend. Um, in Foucault's great book, or great series of books, The History of Sexuality, there's the germ of the idea for what we now call queer theory. Um, there you'll find the shocking revelation that gay as an identity didn't even begin to emerge until the 19th century. Um, uh, that before the invention by a German zoologist of all people of homosexuality, there was no labels, there was just sexual acts. Sexual identity is an invention of the industrial era and of Victorian morals. Homosexuality was shaped first by, by medicine, by zoology, where it quickly became classified as a disease after its discovery in 1967, and then it became a crime. Then it became characterised by law. As I'm sure you know, it also became a crime in, in most of the world. So we only have a century between the invention of homosexuality and remember before homosexuality or heterosexuality or whatever, there were just sexual acts, not sexual identities. There, there just wasn't. Um, so between the invention of homosexuality and Stonewall, the famous watershed moment for gay liberation in the West, um, uh, there's not very much time at all. So Stonewall, I'm sounding very history lesson here, but it's still a good story. Here in a mafia-owned gay bar in downtown New York City where the fire exits were blocked and the drinking glasses were rarely washed, a raid came, not by the health department, because of numerous OH&S violations, but by the public moral squad. Um, back in that year, when I was born, uh, what many participants call the last straw um, came to break the back of a very patient queer temper, and the men and the very few women at the Stonewall Inn fought, fought back against the moral squad. So this moment and this memory of Stonewall continues to inform all pride events that we see around the world, all profitable pride events we see, and they've now passed into the orthodox gay history. Um, but it's also worth remembering that the Stonewall Inn, a place with what we would now call radical queers and not, as legend has it, Judy Garland impersonators, has, was itself discredited by some of New York City's more established homosexual identities at the time. There was newsletters um, talking about this dreadful place where people weren't proper homosexuals. Um, in the space of 40 years, we've turned from since this 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 wonderful memory of Stonewall, and that you know this is the day that we celebrate Pride Day, and, and you know its various iterations such as Midsummer and Mardi Gras. So in the space of 40 years, we've turned from radicalism to absolute radish. I think the the Stonewall Inn turned from a place that housed difficult gender queer hippies to a whitewash, or should that be stonewashed? Um, foundation on which a more conservative gay identity was built. Um, thanks in very large part to the, the growth of what I see as a gay bureaucracy, the hard to define characters of the 60s, those people sliding up and down the Kinsey scale like there was no tomorrow, um, both in act and in demeanour and dress, um, morphed back into static homosexuals. Still then, a very new tradition created by the law and by psychiatry, you know, a, a, a crime, an illness. So some queer theorists, um, people far more radical and engaged than I am, remind us that the criminal deviant, the, the medicalized homosexual loony, are the direct antecedents of the gay that we see before us today. By calling oneself gay, this is how queer theory proceeds now, and, ex and accepting the many conventions of the new gay orthodoxy, we are affirming, so the theory goes, a history of crime, a history of disease. Since the 1990s, as many of you are probably aware, a number of writers, activists, performers, and everyday people with libidos have sought to refuse the very idea of sexual identity itself, which is actually still, I think, quite a radical idea arguing that this one-size-fits-all definition is not only difficult to live with, it's a man-made fiction. So this is more or less how queer theory proceeds, although it offers far more cleverness in $20 words than I have, and maybe for the purposes of faintly less dreary lunchtime discussion than we've endured such far, so that thus far, um, it's more fun and instructive for us to look at how this plays out in the real gay world. I will get to arts in a moment, I, I promise. So it didn't take long post Stonewall for the, the firmament of the gay culture to become illuminated by prejudice and populated by absolute twits. Um, you can trace bigotry very easily in the growth of the gay alphabet. You know the one? G-L-B-T-Q-I. Um, I, 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 that's what it is, I think, at last count. Um, gay, which in the Stonewall days, once a term that meant nothing but bent, came to mean gay men exclusively. 
and gay culture fairly much for a long time came to mean gay men exclusively um, and to a large degree it still does. Lesbians of the L, of the, the, the gay and lesbian alphabet, agitated for their presence in community and, pro and professional groups. Um, I don't think bisexuals bothered much, but they got the B anyway. Um, I would say my personal theory is this was to boost attendance at parties, which, let's face it, were looking pretty shit by the time CNC Music Factory had released their first album. Um, the addition for of T for transgender was very, very hard won. And anyone who has had anything to do with a professional community gay organisation will know just how much transgendered people are despised by orthodox gays. Um, once, once upon a time, I experimented with being a professional gay person, and I wasn't very good at it. Um, I decided I might like to try my hand at programming, uh, program directing a queer, or rather a gay and lesbian radio station. Um, there was a, a, a trio of um, male to female transgendered people who did the, or a trio of women, um, who did the most extraordinary trans program every week. And it had been consigned by my predecessor to the adults only time of 11 p.m. Um, it was actually the best thing on the radio station. Um, when I insisted it be moved to seven, I was met with absolutely fierce objection. Uh, one gay male volunteer told me that um, trans issues were offensive to very many people and that he didn't want the community represented like that. Um, I told him to get fucked, which <coughs> explains why I ran screaming from the building and have never again attempted being a professional gay or a manager, because I'm very bad at both. Um, as for the people who don't identify as one gender or the other, those intersex people of the gay alphabet sandwich, you just forget about it, that they are even marginally less marginalised by the gay orthodoxy is in question. All this talk in gay culture of suicide prevention and shelter from bullying is, in my experience, a crock of shit. The remit of traditional gay and lesbian kindness is extended only to those who have a recognisable traditional gay and lesbian sexual identity. Um, so if you've not had the special pleasure of an up-close look at the gay way of performing community business, no doubt you've seen the Mardi Gras on, on television. And it's here again that I think we see some glitzy evidence of a blunted, meaningless blob of a bloated culture yawning, gagging for a gob full of nothing but conformity. Um, I wrote a piece today for Sydney Morning Herald about gay marriage. Um, and once again, my phone and my inbox is running, running hot. Um, it's, it's, it, it's very strange. I, 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 I wrote about gay marriage partly because I was angry and partly because it's my job, but chiefly, of course, because you know, I do want more angry emails from drag queens who want to piss on me. But anyway, let it be said, the principal theme of Mardi Gras this year 2011 is gay marriage. Oh, yay, how revolutionary. At last count, 15 floats will take their uh, cue from what is, let's face it, a withering institution. A matrimonial spectacular featuring bride with bride and groom with groom will be the centrepiece of the annual long mince. Um, apparently, marriage is now the knee blue ultra of the gay struggle. Uh, this is odd, and it strikes me as no more critical or opposite to the needs of homosexuals than the right of cyclists to ride a penny farthing. Same-sex marriage is clearly the big issue that our community wants to say something about in this year's parade, organisers said last month. Um, I, I just don't see what good can come of this very glitzy fight, um, save for it providing a rationale for me to stay home on the sofa, not go to Mardi Gras, throw things at the very telegenic Ruby Rose, and wonder, aloud and alone, when the hell popular theories of gay liberation dwindled so as to make a song by Lady Gaga read like the Kinsey Report. If we don't count the company of the Christian right, I will be abstaining from Mardi Gras and marriage by myself. The gays will not join me in considering that the idea of marriage is a bit naff, nor will anyone else in sort of progressive circles. Um, suddenly, every progressive is banging on about marriage as though it's a breathtaking new idea. Um, so, like spinsters ready to receive a bouquet of dog whistles, the, the left is absolutely lurching to revive the bloom of this very wilted tradition of, of marriage. Our Greens, um, many of our public thinkers and half of our most attractive comedians and performers have raised to declare their support for the right to be wed, just like in the old days. 
So affirming gay marriage has kind of become a progressive reflex, even beyond the gay culture about which I was speaking. And, and there's absolutely no scope for deb debate. Just forget about it. Supporting same-sex marriage is compulsory. It's, it's like an objection to genetically modified food or a preference for buying organic. One can't say that marriage, particularly the gay kind of marriage, is silly without being pelted by conventionally grown vegetables. Um, so at the risk of upsetting the workers, the international workers of the world and the biodynamic markets at which they shop with their lesbians in Subaru outbacks, uh, who caused me to buy raincoats, I just can't get excited about the right to an institution predicated on some pretty wacky old nonsense. Um, of course, we support the right of others to believe in wacky old nonsense. Um, affianced gay Christians must take every risk they can to be wed by the delusion of their choosing. Where marriage is a matter of faith, the faithful should take it up with their clerics. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, but they're taking it up with their legislators, and no one can tell me why, but everybody's supporting it. Um, Same-sex couples are largely no longer discriminated against in, in law. In 2009, the federal Labor government passed a suite of legislative changes um, recommended by HERIOC, the Human Rights and Equal Opportunities Commission. Um, now, not everything that um, should be done has been done, but a, a massive amount was. Um, it wasn't a symbolic thing. It didn't involve a bridal registry, uh, and it received very little press. Um, but these 58 alterations to real estate, superannuation, and sundry other really, really boring acts were a great win. Um, my partner is female. I thank the gay and lesbian rights lobby for the real and practical difference they made to the lives of myself and others. Um, there is more to do. Uh, but now, for example, the simple dignity, for example, of compassionate leave is extended to a bereaved same-sex partner. It never was before until 2009. So that, to me, absolutely pressing civil equality issue in a reasonable and just country. Um, getting hitched, not. Um, this is not to suggest for a minute, though, that the creation of like long-term intimacy is anything short of wonderful with the person of your choosing, proclivity, whatever. My own partnership of 12 years is my life's absolute central feat. It's been sanctioned by the years, it's been sanctioned by difficulty, um, the unified loathing of my mother, and no, I'm <laughs> joking. No, I'm not. It's, it's funny because it's true. Um, and also by love. It will never be sanctioned by compliance to the terms of a rickety institution. But gay itself has become a very rickety institution. It's wedded to the idea of weddings, of military participation, and, oh God, cheering on out footballers. The visible gay culture retains all of the radicalism of a radish. Um, marriage equality is not a progressive struggle, but an effort to privilege one kind of relationship, long-term and monogamous, above all others. And I do wonder how this is going to... Oh, heavens to Betsy. Oh, I was just getting... I was just peeking there. Now you put me off. <laughs> yeah, I won't do that bit. Um, so gay and progressive uh, um, communities have, are selling up and they're buying into a market long since ruined. We're trading, in a hist we're trading in our history, our queer history, rich indifference, at the altar of absolute conformity. On, on Saturday night, you know, Mardi Gras night, the new currency of achievement will be measured by faithful brides and grooms, and I'll be throwing up. On the foundation of Stonewall, apparently, we've built a reception centre. We've taken a jackhammer to the best of what was gay culture. This is what devotion to a static, definable, entirely government-fundable sexual identity gets you, an interest in a bridal registry. Some people even call marriage equality, the civil rights movement of our time. I call it a crock of shit and a distraction from the real legal struggles, such as parental and adoptive rights that remain. And contrary to the opinion of the man who accused me of writing from the closet, I do acknowledge that there are struggles that remain. They, they very much are. As much as I'd like to live in a queer utopia, I don't. Um, so in part, it was these things that inspired to me, this understanding that inspired me to write publicly about gay art and what a silly idea it is. Um, we have an idea of, of sexual identity that many people agree is stricken. And we have a culture that takes equal inspiration from bigotry and a disease model of sexuality. I'm talking about the gay culture. 
Back in the 90s, we actually used to talk about this thing called infirmary feminism. That is, we saw a movement that had become dependent on the idea of its own special frailties. Um, this is doubly true in gay organisations. I think it's become part of a culture happy to define itself by its maladies. Um, to invoke the dreadful but often wonderful Camille Paglia, I uh, lost three quarters of the room just by saying that name, I'm sure. Um, this is what she said about infirmary feminism, and the same is true of gay culture. Feminism has become a catch-all vegetable drawer where bunches of clingy sob sisters can store their mouldy neuroses. And, and in part, it's become a culture desperate, this is gay culture, to be straight as, I don't know, Natalie Portman's chest in the last half of Black Swan. And it's these conditions, part sheltered workshop and part, part desperately conformist, these conditions that we have gay arts festivals and, and we hope for the emergence of great art. The desire to please everybody, fused with the fact of wanting an uncritical audience, is going to give us little but the shits and awful play, plays about pale little twinks coming out. It's, a, it's appalling to reference one's own Facebook wall in a public forum, but these words by the, the very great librettist, our, our own Casey Bonetto, bear repeating. On the charge that I had in proposing that homosexual arts festivals were a terrible idea, forgotten how safe and supportive the community could be, um, Casey answered uh, my critic far better than I could. It's these words, safe and supportive, that bother me. For good work, every room is safe and supportive. That's what makes it good work. When it becomes the job of the audience to support the work, as opposed to the pleasure of the audience to experience it on whatever level, then there is a problem developing because it is not a realistic model on which to base a performance. The infirmary homosexual um, says that the midsummer, the arts component of the Midsummer Festival, for example, is an environment in which one can test the water with new works. And then Casey chimes in again, but you can't really test the waters when the waters have been pre-warmed to your satisfaction. To extend the metaphor painfully, personally, when I stumble into a patch of warm water, I'd, I'd much rather the warmth came from sunshine. Um, Casey clearly doesn't want anyone pissing in his water or in his pocket. Um, but just as you can't argue against marriage without being called a human rights denier, you can't really within the gay culture or just, um, or just outside the gay culture, within progressive culture, argue for the pointlessness of gay arts. Um, this is not to downplay the quality of all midsummer endorsed or queer marketed works by any means. In fact, some of them can actually be good. And I, and I say this, um, I, and when they are good, I'd say this is in spite of the gay orthodoxy and the support they offer and not because of its warm waters. Um, but it's to question the value of a, a festival dedicated to promoting homosexuals in the arts. I just, I can't get my head around that. It's the one part of the world where we're actually overrepresented. Um, with, with faintly more legitimacy, I'll quote myself because I stayed up all night writing these paragraphs for the age and I probably can't uh, do better in closing than um, read you this. Um, Queer and camp have long informed many of our best regarded narratives, our best regarded works. Indefinite sexuality continues to appear in much of our art and whether explicit or implicit has always exist existed centrally to our art as a broader culture. Um, queers, if you just take the trouble to look for us, are in the story, in the central story. A gay arts event seeks to move them back into the fringe. Um, these days, the general gay culture exists as a sanctuary for those who have surrendered the hope or the need for equality. Now the gay arts culture exists as a currency for those who have given up on art. Now, an individual work might be passionately avant-garde, resolutely mainstream, really good, or just really shitty. Whatever it is at Midsummer or a queer endorsed arts festival, it is first and foremost a function of sexuality. Um, understanding sexuality as a spectrum on which all players are equal is revolutionary. I applaud this idea. Understanding art in the same way as a spectrum on which all people are equal, terrible mistake. Um, an arts event, a homosexual arts event, manages the simultaneous feat of elevating shit and diminishing ex excellence. Here, reeking floor shows steeped in misogyny from long ago and locked in a darker decade are afforded the same status as thoughtfully, provocatively curated visual works. So in this, in this hideously democratised world of gay, 
Oscar Wilde and Todd Haynes have no ranking that exceeds RuPaul. Here endeth the lesson. Thank you for your attention. Somebody berate me.